Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today is Monday and we are starting a new book. We finished Angela's Ashes last week. You guys voted on Norse Myth last week and uh, every Monday the poll goes up for my Friday content so you can check that out on my Twitter and on my Instagram stories. Today I wanted to actually talk about this behemoth, the Greek plays. It has a really nice collection of a variety of plays by Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the three major Greek tragedians. And I actually had quite a bit of anxiety figuring out what I wanted to read next. It's interesting how no matter how long I do this, I continue to be, of course, influenced by what I think my viewers want to see. And with the upload schedule and the reading schedule, because I'm doing five videos a week, it actually puts quite a bit of crunch time on my reading. So the only thing that I'm reading is what I'm reading for this channel. And so if there's stuff that I want to read, it has to be what I'm also going to talk about. And I don't really have a lot of wiggle room on that. And since as many of you may know, I have been wanting to work through sort of the, the classic canon of Western civilization. I think it makes a really great foundation for any student of literature to then be able to speak with sophistication about any other book. It just creates a really nice scaffolding for comparative looks at literature, contrasting, understanding the worldview of, you know, sort of Western civilization, how it formed right or wrong, just really giving you a deep understanding for those things. And so um, we already have the Iliad and the Odyssey videos up on my channel. And um, next up are the Greek plays. So before I actually talk about a play, tomorrow I will be reading The Persians by Aeschylus, which is relatively short. So I'm planning on getting through all of it tonight so that we can have that ready for discussion for tomorrow. But I wanted to do kind of like a video that does a foundation on Greek play. I think it'll be really useful to have just on my channel. We can refer back to at various times if we come back to this topic, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea of Greek theater, there are many societies that have had theater, Japan, China, South America, and even just ritualistic traditions and festival kind of becomes theatrical, a lot of dance a lot of performance becomes a part of you know what your what ritualistic traditions look like for many ancient societies but the basis for what would become theater as we understand it in the modern world really does go back to the ancient Greeks our vocabulary is derived from it even the word theater is from a Greek word tragedy drama scene all of these words kind of go back to original Greek words the main event for Greek theater was definitely the in the fifth century in Athens there was an annual festival to Dionysus and part of that sort of the main event even of that was this theatrical competition three playwrights would be selected to then ultimately compete against each other you won not on the basis of as we think about it as a literary form, you know, on the basis of how well the play was written or how well the play was acted, but actually it was based on like how fantastic the scenes and the various devices that they used, because they had like, you know, mechan <laughs> mechanical arms and stuff like this that would bring in god figures or, and, and it was very expensive. So it was like on the production side, that's how you won. It was done with a public funding, but a lot of private funding. There were a lot of private donors who would have put a big bucks behind these productions. And the performances were kind of seen as a public good, almost a public work. It was essential for the welfare of the community. And that's where we see sort of the com combination of the religious aspect with the communal aspect with the theater aspect, I guess. <laughs> Lost my train of thought there. Even after Athens was defeated by Sparta, the tradition continued and theater spread across sort of the Grecian landscape, the, the Hellen, Hellenic and Hellenistic landscape, and then into Rome and plays were written in Latin and, and the tradition was continued. And it's still influential today. We still put on a lot of these plays. And in fact, some of these plays, oh, a plane is going overhead. I live near an airport, so this is a frequent occurrence. Sometimes I don't notice it because I'm so into what I'm talking about that I just like blast right through. So you know, I'm into it. 
But you know, these these it's they're dealing with transcendent themes. So these plays still continue to be influential today, not least of which which Aeschylus. I think even as recently as you know, our conflicts in the Middle East, the play The Persians, which Persia, the Persian Empire is where we see, you know, modern day Iran. So during the Gulf Wars, this play was sort of referred to because it has this real enduring power to it, even though it's even more transcendent, obviously, than just being about the geographical location of where it's set. But, you know, you, you have stories of how, how to face and survive tragedies. You see plays as part of a greater festival of wearing costumes and masks and people playing ro roles. And in a way, it's sort of externalizing the forces that are within us that are outside of our control. So there's so much, you know, of who we are where I think we like to th think that we're more in control. And this is something that I think I talked about with the Iliad as well, where you have like the God within and the God without, so the ways in which sort of mythology can also tell us about these stories of these unbidden forces that are part of our psychology, they're part of our motivation, they're part of our curiosity, they're part of you know our lust, what we might call our id in Freudian type terms. So we have all of these impulses that are, are, are part of who we are and, uh, <laughs> I mean, even the fact that like we kind of like conk out at night and like go to sleep, could even sleep, you know, of course, as a god in, in the Greek conception. But it's like the, we have these forces, these unbidden forces that control so much of who we are. And it's through ritual, through theater, you can externalize them and symbolize them with mask and play and um, costume. And, and therefore kind of try to understand who you are and your place in society given these forces both outside of you and within you that are so incomprehensible in some ways. It's also about the limitations of human knowledge over and over again, kind of like what I talked about with Emma. Again, I compared it to Greek, uh, Greek play and that it's really, really true. There, there's a common theme of human blindness, of humans incapacity to understand themselves or the world around them, to not be very far-sighted. And this idea of having, you know, a seer, a soothsayer is very important in a lot of plays. That fate might be predicted for you by visiting the oracle and its inescapability. It's often about humans' fallibility and the way that we deal with it. Most of the plays were retellings of stories that were already familiar, much like Roland. And, and in fact, we even talked about this, I believe, in our Iliad and Odyssey videos because he, I talked about how there was a greater context for the stories, this sort of like mythical context, that this, these were just like one little snippet of this grander narrative. Well, the reason why we know the grander narrative is a lot of times because of these plays. So Aeschylus's Oresteia is telling the story sort of of Agamemnon returning much like Odysseus's return. And so what happened when Agamemnon came home in his kingdom? And so this is all sort of dealing with that same sort of cycle of stories, a lot of them, you know, with the Trojan War. These stories, stories are sort of a, a pseudo history. So they wouldn't have changed the outcome or the, the basic bones of the stories, but they could put different spins or interpretations on it. Uh, on this sort of like core, core material. So is Orestes vengeful? Is he reluctant? And you could put different interpretations on these characters in your, your version of the play or the story, or however you know, you're putting this story forth. Most involve a reversal of expectations or fortunes. And a lot of times we're dealing with this idea of an error in judgment. The word in Greek is hamartia. And in fact, it's the, the biblical word in Greek for sin as well. And it's, a, it's an archery term. It means to miss the mark. And I think, again, that correlates with this idea of human blindness. So maybe we're armed, we're, we're dangerous in one sense that we can cause ourselves and others pain. So it's like we're winged Cupid painted blind, as Shakespeare would say. So and we've got like this bow and we're like, oh, we're missing the mark. And so it's not so much blame for our fallibility, but the idea of being humble in recognizing that that's, that you have this limited capacity. And the other thing that is often decried in these books is obviously hubris or, or this overweening pride. And, and this is the counterpoint to that. Um, a human error is just inevitable and we don't have the control that we think we have in our lives. Divine intervention often happens. It's often needed to sort of, you know, set the world 
right again. Perfect timing is often a good hint that, you know, a god or a goddess might be involved. The gods really are quite cold and distant. I talked about this with our Norse mythology on Friday that, you know, the, the, the Norsemen really didn't, the Vikings, really didn't have a sense of like, oh, I'm going to cry out to God to alleviate my circumstances, to alleviate my pain. And you kind of get a similar sense here that the gods have their own agendas of what they're tri trying to achieve in space and time through human history. And humans kind of just have to roll with the punches. They're ambivalent to human suffering, sometimes even callous to it. There's a sense in which, you know, their eternal existence makes them not really understand what human suffering is. They're also sort of, again, as embodiments of forces that are outside of our control. And again, this makes sense. So if you have Athena, who's the goddess of love, it's like, you know, all of us have experienced, or most of us have experienced that thing where like lust kind of takes, takes over. You have this like animal passion, this animal desire. And that's like kind of how they're embodying it and sort of concretizing it into a particular form and saying like, oh, here's how we can explain that. It's uh, Athena took over your, or I'm uh, not Athena, Aphrodite took over your body. Pretend I said Aphrodite from the beginning. In these plays, we see that women have quite a bit of power. We have really, really powerful female characters. They speak for themselves. They devise plots and execute them. They discuss politics. You know, they're given very intelligent and powerful speeches. But we know from Greek history that this was not so for the, you know, for women in Greek society, in Greek society at this time. And it's even doubtful as to whether women would have even been allowed to attend these plays. Some conventions of Greek drama to be aware of, they would have worn sort of like these huge oversized masks. And if you think about, you know, performance in that time trying to uh, uh, present an idea, almost a caricaturized idea to people in the back of an amphitheater, then you have to have these sort of like oversized masks, these oversized expressions to be able to communicate those ideas. It would have been all male actors, so even the female characters would have been played by men. Only a, a, there would only be a few actors, and so they'd sort of like switch the masks on and off to be able to sort of symbolize like, oh, I'm now this character, right? A violent action would have been all off stage. So even though there's quite a bit of violence and action in Greek plays and the Iliad and the Odyssey, there's all these war scenes. It would not have been, you know, blood and gore on stage. It would have been like off stage, and then a messenger comes in and reports, oh no, like. Agamemnon's dead, or Clytemestra's dead, or whatever. The chorus is, is there as sort of like a body of characters. Usually they represent a particular body of citizens, oftentimes the Senate or elders of the city or something like that. And they sometimes interacted with characters, but a lot of times they're there to provide commentary, sometimes clarification of what's going on. In Aeschylus' time, the chorus would have been uh, comprised of 12 men. By the time we get to Sophocles, he expanded it to 15. We don't really know why. Composed in meter, so the, all of these plays are in like poetic meter, much like we're familiar with with like Shakespeare. Again, I think that makes it just easier to memorize your lines, but it also makes it part of the you know, you kind of get a chanting sing song, like this performative aspect to these types of poems. It, it's all part and parcel of that same experience. So sometimes it would have been iambic, like Shakespeare, sometimes dactylic, like the Iliad, and sometimes it would have been done in anapests or even more complicated combinations of sort of meter. And anapests are unstressed, unstressed, stressed. An anapest itself is an anapest. That's how you remember that one. <laughs> and of course people go, and not pest, and then they all sound the same, but that doesn't help you. So don't do that. And a pest. <laughs> I'm such a goober. I'm such a goober sometimes, you guys. That's like a tip for your, you know, Litling AP test or whatever. Anywho, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides were considered the best by the ancients. They themselves sort of referred back to these poem, po not poets, tragedians, these playwrights a lot and quoted from these plays and other pieces of literature a lot. Again, you can kind of, I, can, I keep pointing up here because my volumes of Shakespeare are here. I don't know if that's like translating, but again, you can compare it to Shakespeare in their sort of how much they were respected and regarded by contemporaries and later. So let's talk a little bit about the Persians, the play, the Persians that I'm gonna read and we'll get into it tomorrow. So most 
Greek plays are about ancient history. Like I said, a lot of them deal with the Trojan War and this sort of pseudo history that is so core to the identity of the Greeks. But the Persians actually deals with recent history. It would have been the Persian War, which Aeschylus himself even participated in that conflict. So this was maybe eight, ten years out from the Persian War. It was not, not very long. I, I think it was eight years out from the end of the Persian War that Aeschylus performed, put on this play. The setting is actually at the Palace of Susa, which is one of the capitals in the Persian Empire. And it is from the perspective of the Persians. So, and it's not there to imagine or really other the Persians in this conflict, unlike, you know, the Song of Roland, which we saw, you know, it was sort of like the Christian good guys versus the Muslim pagan bad guys. And it was a very much an othering type of language that, and you could even see the amount of ignorance that was there in their conception of what the Muslims believed and who they worshiped. This is actually taking a very empathetic view. And so you're looking at the conflict from their side and saying like, oh, their sons and husbands are dying in battle. This is a state of grief for them. And so it's a very sort of humane story, a very humane perspective. And I'm very excited about it. What it does do, <laughs> there is a sort of orientalism that happens as well. So there is, a, it emphasizes the cultural gap between the Greeks and the Persians. So it viewed the Persians as sort of the sumptuous uh, society that was wealthy and spent too much money and was too extravagant. It's definitely monarchy versus democracy. So in that way, it really is reinforcing this Greek identity as superior. It's also dealing with this idea of hubris or, and then also the concept of Ate overreaching. So this idea that Xerxes has, you know, he's gone, it's a, it's a bridge too far. He's like reaching too far. Like the gods have sort of said, like, you have this dominion, don't go past it because you don't have a right to this dominion and we're going to have a smackdown on you if you do. Some of the language to look out for as you're reading this is the idea of cables. Aeschylus is going to use this language symbolically over and over again to not just refer to the ships, which had a lot of ropes and rigging and all of that, but also to the bridge that Xerxes built across the Hellespont. So this, again, this idea of overreaching. And then also this idea of slavery. So this idea that he's attempting to put a yoke of slavery upon Greece. Zygma is the Greek word there. It is both a link or a, a link of chains, but it also is the same word for yoke. And that's how those ideas sort of like get synthesized together. And, and again, the point of this story is to see the battle through the eyes of your enemy. So that is a little bit of an introduction on the play of the Persians. We're going to read it and talk about it tomorrow. So until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.